school. So how many people right now are interested in going to medical school? Oh, okay, even more than 7.30 this morning. Uh, what about dental school? Okay, vet school, okay, pharmacy school, physical therapy. Uh, how many engineering students do we have? Ah, okay, yes. And so this course is so important because the grade that you make in the first semester general chemistry course uh, really can be the difference between whether you're going to get into the professional school of your choice later on or get the kind of job that pays you based on your ability and not just on your GPA. And uh, you'll see in a minute that the students who attended this, by the end of the semester, they finished the course with a B average versus a C average for students who did not. So you're in the right place today. Okay, and uh, the Center for Academic Success actually has been recognized nationally as one of the outstanding learning centers in the nation. We got the Outstanding Learning Center in the Nation Award in 2004, 2005. There are about 2,000 learning centers at various kinds of institutions around the country. And each year, the national organization picks one to be Outstanding Learning Center, and we got that distinction. And another distinction that we've gotten, there's a national award that is given to institutions and to faculty members who have been outstanding mentors to students who are in science, technology, engineering, or mathematics. And that award is given in the White House, and we got that award in 2006. And the reason that we were able to get that award is because of the way that we've been able to help students to really realize their dreams. And I've got uh, three students up there who were Chem 1201 students, and you can see their first scores, their before scores, and then the scores that they got on exams after hearing the strategies that you're going to hear about today. And so let me just ask everybody, well, during the presentation, I'm going to be asking you a lot of questions. There's really no right or wrong answers to the questions I ask. I just want you to think about it and let me know what you think. But at the 730 class, I asked the class, um, how many of you thought that the exam was difficult? Okay, and this is kind of like 7.30. Many people said that they didn't think it was all that difficult, but how many people got a score less than your desired score on the test? Okay, yeah, that was pretty much everybody. And so what we're going to talk about is why there's that disconnect and what you can do so that on your next exam, you will get the score that you are able to get. And I'm sure that none of these three students thought that they would start out with a 42, a 60, or a 63, but they all ended up with A's. And so the reason I like to come after the first exam is I want you to know that it doesn't really matter what your score on the first exam is. We've had students who made uh, 30 on the first exam and still ended up with a B in the course. And so um, the first student, Robert, 42 straight hundreds, then Christy, 60, 100, 99, 84. And you'll see Blanche actually took a little bit longer to kind of warm up to uh, getting her 100, but 63, 79, 87. And so what we're going to be talking about is those strategies that will allow you to make the same kind of improvement on your next test. And I think I just want to start out by telling you what the most uh, impactful strategy is. And I found, I taught at Cornell University for about uh, 20 years before coming back down to LSU. And it was actually when I was at Cornell that I learned the single most important problem, mistake that most students were making that made them get less on their exam than they thought they understood. And that is how they were doing their homework. They were not getting the most out of their homework. And so let me just ask, and I'm going to include myself because unfortunately I was doing this too. Uh, how many of, of you, when you did the homework, you read the problem, and then you flipped back in the chapter to find an example of the problem that you had to work and sort of use the example? Raise your hand if you've ever done that. Ah, OK, yeah, everybody is doing that. Well, the problem with doing that is that would be a great way to do the homework if when we got to the test, we got an example of the test, and then the professor said, and here's examples of the problems that are on the test. But they don't do that. And so what you've got to do is prepare your brain to do the task that it has to do on the test. And so what happens is when we are looking at the example, were we doing that homework problem? No. What was doing the homework problem? Exactly, the example or the book. And so what do we recommend you do instead of doing that? What we recommend that you do is before you look at the first 
problem. Study the information. Start to learn the information. Study it as if you're going to have it on a test or a quiz the next day. You know, you focus in a little bit more if you're studying for a test or a quiz. We'll study it really, really intently. And whether or not you're using the book or you're using your notes, you're going to come across examples. And at this point, um, when you get to an example, either in your notes or in the book, what do you do? You can be brutally honest with me. What do you do? <laughs> OK, skip it. How many people typically skip the examples? OK, most people do that. I want you to commit to never skipping another example from now on, because the examples are your brain's best resource for demonstrating that it can do the problems without looking at an example. And if you've studied the information, and you're very, very bright, that's why you're here, if you've studied the information, you'll be able to just read the problem in the example. Don't look at what the author did. Work the problem yourself until you get an answer. And even if you think that you're stuck, you don't really know what to do next, just power through it until you get an answer. And then when you get the answer, compare your answer to the answer that's in the book. If you got the same answer, then you can look at what the author did. But if you didn't get the same answer, don't look yet. Try to figure out where your mistake was. Now, at this point, are mistakes good or bad, do you think? Good. Absolutely, they're good. You know, the interesting thing, I, I do a lot of presentations to faculty. And every time I ask faculty, uh, what do you think students say? They always say bad. And I tell them, no, students know that mistakes at this point are good. Now, I'm not saying that it's not good if you don't make a mistake. It's great if you don't make a mistake. But if you make a mistake at this point, it's good. Why is making a mistake at this point good? Why, why would that be good? Absolutely. I'm hearing all the, the right things. One, it doesn't hurt you because you don't lose points. Two is if you make the mistake there and correct it, where are you not going to make that same mistake? Absolutely, where it is going to hurt you. And now, I've heard a lot of people say, oh, I would have done so much better on that exam, but I just made a lot of careless mistakes. So how many of you have ever gotten an exam back and you saw that you made careless mistakes and you would have done a lot better without the mistake? OK, that always happens. But what we say is, when you really think about it, there's really no such thing as a careless mistake. Mistakes only look careless in retrospect. Once you know what the right thing is, then the mistake that you made looks careless. But mistakes are things that have to be made. And so if you don't make them during this process and correct it during that process, you are going to make it on the test. And so what we want you to do is study the information. And then when you get to an example, read the example, work the problem till you get an answer, correct your mistakes at that point, and then when you get to the actual homework, do two or three problems without looking at any external aids. And then you can go back and check to make sure that you did all the steps and everything was, was correct. But do you see how what you're doing is you're training your brain to do the task that it has to do on the test? Because now it knows it doesn't need an example. And this is what the, those students did. Now, uh, the other thing that we encourage you to do is not give up too soon. Try to make your brain think of, what could I possibly do next? Even if it says, I have no idea what to do, then push it a little bit. Um, because you want to give it time to think. But don't spend too much time on it. Um, because if you're spending more than 30 minutes on a problem, that, that's too much. So then you can look it up. But then just make a little note that you haven't done that problem by yourself. And then you can come back and, and do that. OK, and that's the number one strategy. We're going to talk about a lot more. But that's the number one that I wanted to mention to you at first. And uh, we saw earlier examples of individual performance. Uh, but this is the the uh, results from when we did this uh, session last year. And you see that the students on the first exam, the students who were here and the students who were not here, had essentially the same score on the first exam. And I talked with Dr. Cook, and I know that the average on the first exam was in the low 70s. But you can see the students who attended went up by about um, six points. And the students who were not here, their average went down. And so by the end of the semester, the students who attended, because they continued to use the strategies during the semester, they had a B average 
versus a C average. And so I have some outcomes that I'd like for you to get out of our short time together this morning. And one is I really want you to analyze the strategies, the things that you've been doing up to this point in Chem 1201. And I want you to see the difference between what you have been doing and what you need to start doing so that you can make the A on the next test that you're capable of doing. I want you to have very concrete strategies that you'll start implementing very soon and that you'll really commit to yourself that you're going to use those strategies, not just in Chem 1201, but in other courses also. And I want you to become a more efficient learner, because very often we get so many students who say, oh, I studied hours and hours and hours, and they still didn't do well. And that just means that they're not studying very efficiently. So we want you to study smarter, not necessarily harder, so that you can still make A's in your courses and have time to do all the fun things, uh, the other fun things uh, at LSU. Okay, so I want to ask a reflection question now, and uh, I want you to think about this. Actually, there are a couple of them. Uh, one is, if I asked you what's the difference between studying chemistry and learning chemistry, what would you say to that? And then the second question is, if I told you that three weeks from now we're faced with one of two tasks, we, are gonna, we will have finished chapters four through six as an exam coming up, and task one, as I say, we, we're going to have this exam, and you need to make an A or a B on that test, nothing lower than a B on that test. The question is, for which task would you work harder? Okay, the second option, though, is I say uh, three weeks from now, we will have finished uh, chapters four through six, and the day before, we're going to do a review of that information, and you're going to conduct that review. So I'm going to call you up to the front of the class, and you're going to teach that information in those chapters to the entire class. So the question is, for which one of those tasks would you work harder? So uh, going back to the first one, I want you to get your own answer to that. Take about 10 seconds or so, and then introduce yourself to your neighbor, and you guys just kind of compare your answers to that question, and we'll come back in a minute and see what we think about that. So difference between studying and, and learning chemistry. Okay, let's see what we've come up with. Now that question of studying and learning, I've, I've literally asked it to over 10,000 people around the country. And uh, in some places, there have been a few people who've said they thought it was exactly the same thing. So I'll ask, is, is there anybody in this group who would say studying and learning are exactly the same thing? Okay, so would somebody share with us how you would characterize the difference between the two? Okay, yes. Okay. Absolutely. Okay, great answer. She's saying studying is you're trying to kind of get everything in your head to do well on the test, but learning is when you know the processes, you understand what's going on so that it's not going to kind of fly out of your head right after the test. Absolutely. Did anybody else uh, describe it a different way? I know somebody did. I need one, mother, one other person to volunteer the difference. Yes. Okay, so studying is memorizing, whereas learning is understanding. Okay, she said studying is memorizing, learning is understanding. And that actually is the number one answer I get from college students. They say, well, Studying is just trying to memorize information for a test or a quiz. It's short term. It's tedious. I hate studying. But learning is when I'm understanding what's going on. I am not going to forget it two weeks from now. I'm going to remember it. And that's extremely important that we make the distinction. So the strategies that we're going to be talking about are strategies that will result in your learning and not just studying. 
And so for the second one, we can do this by show of hands. How many people would work harder for making a good grade on the test? Okay, how many people would work harder if you had to teach the information? Okay, and that is typical of audiences. And I'm not saying that the people who would study harder for the test are doing anything wrong, but most people, including myself, if I've got to study for a test, then I'm really kind of concerned about what's going to be on the test, making sure that I kind of understand that. But if I have to teach it, and this is what students have told me, if they have to teach it, then they're anticipating questions that are going to come from the audience. So they're really trying to prepare themselves to answer all the questions, and so they work a lot harder at that. And so let me ask, up to this point, um, how many of us would say that we have been in study mode and not learn mode? Raise your hand if you've been in study mode, okay? Uh, how many of us would say we've been in scenario A mode, I want to do really well on the test, rather than in scenario B mode, I need to teach the information? Okay, yes, again, that's what most people are, are doing. Now, the good news about the teaching information, the teaching strategy is you don't have to have your own class to practice teaching the information. If you have empty chairs in your room, if you have stuffed animals, if you have imaginary friends, uh, just any audience that you can recite the information to or explain it to, it's very useful. And the reason that works is this. How many people have ever thought that they totally understood something, but then they started explaining it to somebody and they realized, oh, I don't quite understand it, and you get stuck. That ever happened? Okay, yeah, but you never would have known that you didn't understand it if you hadn't been going through the process of explaining it. And so that's the benefit of pretending that you're teaching the information you uncover those things that you thought you totally understood that you didn't, and then what do you do when you find out, oh, I really don't understand that totally. What do you do? Exactly, you go back and you look it up. And this time you really master it because you're looking to master that information. And so what we want you to do from now on is to concentrate on being in learn mode and not study mode. And also study as if you have to teach the information to the class and you're really going to see your, the amount of information that you've learned is going to significantly increase. And I, I see people taking notes, and that's absolutely fine to take notes. This presentation, though, is going to be available on the Moodle site after we do the 2.30 class this afternoon. So feel free to take notes, but you don't have to get everything down. OK, so, so why is it that Chem 1201 is, um, is so much more of a challenge? It's because it really is harder than high school chemistry. Have you found that the class moves faster? OK, absolutely. And the material really is conceptually more difficult. Um, she's requiring that you not just memorize information, but that you understand the processes. And actually, I'm, I'm reminded now of one of the most interesting answers I've ever gotten to that question of the difference between studying and learning and it was when I was talking to students at the LSU Dental School. And this one young man said, well, the difference for me is this. He said, studying is focusing on the what's. But learning is focusing on the why's, the how's, and the what ifs. And I find that if I focus on the what's and forget the what's, I can't recreate them. But if I understand the why's, the how's, and the what ifs, even if I forget the what's, I can recreate them. And so when you're looking at things, for example, in chemistry like periodic properties, uh, do the sizes of the atoms increase going left to right or decrease going left to right? What do they do top to bottom? If we understand why the trends are the way they are, then we will do much, much better. We're actually learning as opposed to just memorizing those characteristics. And the problems are more involved. They require your understanding of more concepts to apply them. And the tests are, are less straightforward. And I have two examples. Dr. Cook provided me examples of items that um, more than half the class missed. And the first one was, uh, which of the following is a homogeneous mixture? And so uh, what is the right answer to that? Ah, I'm hearing some A's and some B's. OK, <clears throat> actually it is A. But what you find is in this particular question, you've got to know the terminology very well. What, what's another way of saying homogeneous mixture? What's one term that's the same as homogeneous mixture? 
Okay, homogeneous means same. Yes, yeah, so it looks like the same composition. But solutions are homogeneous mixtures. And so if we know the terminology to the extent that our, our brain just goes immediately to that definition, then we're not going to miss that. Now, do you know which answer most people put who got it wrong? What do you think? E, yeah, actually more people said E. And I think the reason more people said E, well actually what is, is oxygen? Okay, it's, it's an element, so it's a pure substance. But I think when people saw oxygen, they were thinking about the air that you breathe, and they knew that the air that you breathe is a, is a mixture. So when you do the things that we're talking about, then your brain is not gonna get confused like that. Okay, and then the, another example was a conversion example. Um, where you had to convert nanometers to meters. And I think what most people did there was their brain immediately went to nano is 10 to the minus 9. And so they picked the 10 to the minus 9, not realizing that we're comparing 654 to 6.54. And if you're looking at 654 compared to 6.54, then it's not going to be 10 to the minus 9. And so when you do the strategies that we're talking about, you're not going to get to an exam where you are making those kinds of mistakes. And so basically we're talking about using metacognition to become an expert learner in chemistry. And metacognition actually is just your ability to think about your own thinking. It's as if you have a big brain outside your brain looking at what your brain is doing. And that brain is saying, okay, is she just memorizing this information or does she know it well enough that she can teach it? And it's not just monitoring it, it's controlling it. So if the answer comes back, well, she's just memorizing this, then that big brain says, stop. You need to do something so that you would be able to teach it, which means that now I've got to practice teaching it. It's your ability to be consciously aware of, of yourself as a problem solver. So any situation that comes up, you can generate solutions to solve that problem. Um, how are you going to make an A on the next test? How do you ace the next test? Learn the material, but also Dr. Cook makes available old exams. They're practice tests. She gives um, additional problems that are recommended problems. If you do all of those things, then you are much more likely to ace the next test. And so your metacognitive mind is always thinking about what can I do to make this happen? And also to accurately judge your level of learning. And by level of learning, we're really talking about uh, Bloom's taxonomy. Now, how many people have uh, never seen Bloom's taxonomy? Oh, okay, quite a few. Bloom's taxonomy is just a hierarchy of learning levels where the very bottom level is just straight memorization, knowledge. Uh, you could give me any formula or any definition that I ask you for if you had knowledge, if you had memorization. But if I asked you to explain in detail why it is we do what we do to calculate empirical formula, if you're only at knowledge, then you wouldn't be able to explain that in your own words. If you're at understanding, you could take anything, explain it in your own words, and you could paraphrase it. You could explain it to your 80-year-old grandmother or your 8-year-old nephew in words they understand. You could give them analogies and examples from their life about limiting reactants or stoichiometry if you're at understanding or comprehension. Now, if you're at application, you can use the information to answer questions, solve problems you've never seen before. If you're at analysis, which is another step higher, you could take any concept, break it down into simpler concepts. And so if I asked you to come up and give me a three-minute mini lecture on empirical formulas, you could talk to me for three minutes about the uh, calculating empirical formula from percent composition, from carbon dioxide data, exactly why it's called an empirical formula, how it differs from a molecular formula if you're at analysis. If you're at synthesis now, you can come up with your own ideas about solving different kinds of problems or different kinds of processes. And if you're at evaluation, you can look at two different ideas, two different processes, and determine whether one is more likely to be correct than, than the other. And so that's that hierarchy. So if I take you back to um, high school, and we'll do this by a show of hands, and if I asked you what was the level that you typically had to operate at in order to make the A's and B's you made in high school, how many people would say it was at the knowledge level? Okay. How many people would say comprehension? Okay. Application, analysis, synthesis, evaluation? 
okay, you're like most of the groups that I talk with, that typically, and I'll show you the data from when I asked a group when we were using clickers, just like you guys. Uh, in high school, typically you were at the knowledge level or comprehension level, and you did very, very well. But now here in Chem 1201 and your other courses at LSU, what do you think the lowest level is you're going to have to operate to make the A's that you're still capable of making? Yeah, what do you think it is? Okay, people are saying analysis. Absolutely right. And we're talking kind of straight out the gate. Um, especially in courses that have those multiple choice tests, you've got to know those concepts very, very well. And so the reason that so many people did not do on the first test what they are smart enough to do is that the only level that they knew to operate at was the levels that they'd been operating at before, but now we've got to kick it up a notch. And so the question is, how do you kick it up a notch? Oh, this was the results from that uh, group that I asked. And they are exactly where you guys are. They saw that it needed to be analysis and in the later years, even synthesis and evaluation. So how do you move yourself higher on blooms? And we recommend the study cycle. And the study cycle is just a five-step process that starts with what you do before you come to class. And that is you need to preview the information that's going to be covered in class before you go to class. And that's so important because what we know from the cognitive science literature is the way the brain works is if it has the big picture of something that it's about to learn, if it starts with that big picture and then gets individual details to fit to fit in that big picture, it's much more efficient at learning it than if it just goes and starts getting the individual details and tries to create its own big picture. And so um, you notice I didn't say read, I said preview. Uh, close your eyes, Dr. Cook, you don't need to see this. Um, how many people routinely read the information that's going to be covered in class before they come to class? Okay, uh, very good. You've got. Great folks here, you can open your eyes up. Okay, so this, this will be for, for your buddies who are not reading. Uh, and, and actually, we don't recommend that students read because um, the students who don't read, we ask them, why don't you read? Great reasons. They say, well, I don't have time to read. Or they say, well, I know I'm not going to understand it. I want to hear it in lecture first. And we understand that. So what we say is take about 10 minutes to preview the information that's going to be covered. And what you're doing is you're giving your brain that big picture. It's almost like you're giving it a skeleton. And so when you come to class, you're going to get the concepts to put the meat on that skeleton. And what our students who've done previewing have told us is they say, wow, lecture makes so much more sense when I do the preview. Because how many people have ever had the experience that you come to class, the information is going from the PowerPoint onto your notes, and it's not passing through there? That ever happened? OK, that is a wasted hour. And so this efficiency, we want you to make every hour in lecture count. And so if you've done the previewing, if you have that skeleton, when she's doing lecture, you're filling in the meat on the skeleton, you're understanding a lot more. And then the next step is to review as soon after lecture as possible what information was covered. Because when you hear something in a lecture, what part of memory does it go into? Absolutely, it goes into short-term memory. If you don't do something to move that information from short-term memory into long-term memory, it's not going to be available to you. And the closer you do something with it to the time that you actually heard it, the easier it's going to be to move it from short-term to long-term memory. And so what we suggest is that as soon as possible, review the information that, that happened in lecture. And I can give you an analogy that will help you understand the, the power of that. How many people here have ever seen a movie, any movie, more than one time? Okay. How many people have noticed that the second time around, you see things that you didn't even know were there the first time? Have you noticed that? Okay. It's exactly the same with your lectures. Your brain will see certain things the first time, but then you, when you review it, it's going to drill down to the next deeper level, and it will see things that it didn't see before. And those are the things that are going to allow you to ace your next test and to actually learn the information. So you got to do the review. Uh, but then you do have to do some more intense study. The ten, if you do the preview and review um, correctly, 
only takes about 10 minutes to do that. Sometimes students say they get to class early, 10 minutes early and do it. Sometimes they'll say if there's no class in the room after, they'll just sit there and do it. Some people do it the night before. It, it doesn't matter when you do it. The important thing is to do it. Uh, but you still got to do more intense studying for longer periods of time. And we call those intense study sessions. And we also suggest that you structure those. Uh, some of our students have used this uh, when we ask, well, what was most helpful for you? They call it the power hour. They say, I use that power hour thing. And so in that process, what you do is take a minute or so to set goals for what you want to accomplish. And then you focus for 30, 40, 50. Even if you only have a 15 minute break, you can do a mini one of these. Focus with study and action. Then take a break. And then come back and review. Because every time you review, you're going to be seeing something that you didn't quite see before. Does that make sense? OK. And so um, there's some other effective metacognitive strategies. And uh, I, I put this one first because it's so important. Working the problems without looking at any example of the, the uh, solution, because that's going to build up your brain's confidence that it can do that. Uh, you got to memorize everything that you're told to memorize. Uh, so often, students, uh, especially things like polyatomic ions or steps to do a certain kind of problem, they intend to memorize the information, but then somehow they might run out of time and they don't actually get to it. But you've got to memorize everything you're told to memorize. Always ask those how, why, and what if questions. Do those mini lectures to the empty chair, to your friends, whomever. Um, but it's also important to try to spend some time on chemistry every day, even if it's only 20 minutes, because you want to keep that very fresh in your mind. Because how many people have to take organic chemistry after general chemistry? OK, yeah, many people do. And if you're not taking organic, you, most people will take some other course that's going to require that you have remembered these concepts. And so if you spend some time making sure that you've learned the concepts so that they're fresh in your mind, that's really helpful. Use the study cycle. Um, SI, supplemental instruction. How many people have been to an SI session? OK, most people have. And Runa uh, does those. She was at the 730 lecture. Uh, but I encourage you to use the SI sessions because they are also very important. She does exercises and things in there that make sure that you understand the concept and see the big picture as opposed to just memorizing information. And then the final thing is aim for 100% mastery, not 90%. Now, the reason I say that is I'll ask you, do you study a little bit differently if you're aiming for 90% versus 100%? OK, what's one thing you do differently? OK, you study more. Um, and I heard somebody say you skip things. And has anybody in here ever had the experience where you're studying for a test and you get to something that seems like it's going to take a long time or it's hard and you say, ah, that's probably not going to be on the test? <laughs> anybody ever done that? OK, is that information on the test? Yes, it's always on the test because the faculty member wants to know who did the 100%. And so I encourage you to aim for 100% mastery because that's going to get you up to that next level also. And then concept mapping. That's extremely important, especially for people who are visual learners, who if you see a picture, there's a saying, a picture is worth a 1,000 words. Sometimes if you see information in a picture, then you remember it more. And so what I recommend is that you come up with, you do chapter maps for every single chapter in general chemistry. And if it's a long chapter, you might have to tape two pieces of paper together. But the idea is you're going to have the title of the chapter, then the primary heading, subheading, secondary um, subheadings. And you can actually do this from the table of contents, because all those things are there. Um, the key to this and, and the beauty in this is now you have the whole chapter on one sheet. It might be a long sheet. And you can use this as a way to practice reciting or teaching the information. So just randomly pick one. Let's say if we pick this circle and practice giving a three-minute mini lecture on that. How does it relate to the circle beside it? How does it relate to the oval above it? How does it relate to the rectangles below it? And so what you're doing is you're making sure that your brain has now the big picture and it sees how these concepts fit together. Does that make sense? OK, yeah. And so these aren't difficult to do, but they're very important. Um, one also really important um, concept map is, ch is the uh, compare and contrast maps. And in compare and contrast maps, if there are any terms that you have any tendency to get confused, 
then just do a compare and contrast map. Um, one in general chemistry might be electron affinity and electronegativity. A lot of times people get those two terms mixed up. And so if you did a concept map on that, how are they different? How are they similar? Then your brain actually delves down and understands that. Uh, something in biology might be uh, prokaryotic cells versus eukaryotic cells. A lot of times people mix that up. Anybody in here taking psychology? OK, in psychology, the main one is punishment and negative reinforcement. Those are two totally different things, but people get them mixed up. And so if you did a compare and contrast map, then that would, would help out. OK, now on the next two slides, I'm going to show you the behaviors after the first exam when I taught this uh, course back in 2009. After the first exam, a lot of people didn't do well. They already knew the strategies before the first exam, but uh, a lot of people didn't do well. A lot of people did very well. And so I asked them to indicate what behaviors they were doing if they did well, and if they didn't do well, what they thought that they should have done that they didn't. And so the top five reasons that students didn't do well on test one was they said they didn't spend enough time on the material. Close your eyes again. Uh, how many people would, th would say that if you had just spent more time on this, you could have done better? OK, yes. And sometimes it's hard to make yourself spend more time. And that's where the time management strategies come in. But that's where if you can just commit to yourself that for at least two hours a day, and sometimes it might be one, sometimes it might be three, but you're going to devote to chemistry because chemistry is so important to your long-term career goals. So they didn't spend enough time on it. They started the homework too late. Um, how many people think that, oh, well, Close your eyes again, yeah. How many people uh, started the homework either a night or two nights before it was due? Ah, okay. So nobody's doing that in here, but uh, in other classes they do that. Um, well, the problem, of course, with starting the homework very late is what's your goal if you're doing the homework the night before? Absolutely, just get her done, get her done. And if, you are, if your goal is just to get everything finished, are you going to be able to make yourself not look at the example? Absolutely not, because your brain is saying, we don't have time to figure this stuff out. Look, just look at the example. And so you have to start it early, the day that it's, it's uh, given, and try to do one or two problems at a time so that you don't get in the time crunch at the end. They didn't memorize the information they needed to. They didn't use the book. And I want to take a minute to talk about the importance of using the book. Uh, I'm sure everybody has the book. Uh, has anybody been in a class even up to this point where the professor says, ah, you don't really need to use the book. The book is optional. Raise your hand. OK. Uh, do not believe that. I will tell you why faculty say it and why it doesn't work for you. OK, if I were to write a C, a, a dash, and a T. And I asked you, what word pops into your head when you see that? What would you tell me? Cat. Cat. OK, sometimes people say cot, sometimes people say cut. Now, the question is, if we lived in a culture that had no cats, and you did not see that word growing up, um, would that word pop into your head? Absolutely not. What we know about the way the brain works is, when you see something that, you're, that your mind is very familiar with, large chunks of it can be left out. But your brain automatically fills that stuff in. That's why you can read text messages. That's why you can read those license plates that have a lot of letters left out. And so when the professor sees, oh, what are you supposed to do if you're not going to use the book? What, what do they give you to learn from? OK, the PowerPoints, yeah, that have, have bullet points. And so since the professor's mind fills in everything other than what's on the bullet points, they think, yeah, everything is there. But everything really isn't there. And what the book does, it has so many more words, it has pictures, it has diagrams, because it fills in the part that your brain doesn't have. And so I do want you to start using the book. Everybody who I've worked with who wasn't using the book, when they started to use the book, they said, wow. I cannot believe what a big difference the book use, uh, makes. And so use the book and do those recommended problems. And then they said they assumed that they understood information that they had read and reread, but had not actually applied. Does that look familiar to anybody? Yeah. OK, now on the other hand, the top five reasons that people made an A were they said they 
conscientiously did the preview review for every class. They started the homework early, did a little bit of it at the time. They used the book and did the suggested problems. They made flashcards of the information that they had to memorize. And I, I like recommending flashcards because you can carry those around with you if you're waiting on the bus or in a bank line. You can pull those things out and go over the information. And they practiced explaining the information to other people. <clears throat> and when you do those, you're going to be learning the information to the extent that you need to, to do it. And so I actually have a reprise um, for this homework slide because uh, I actually am involved in projects with other chemistry faculty members in other places around the country. And uh, their students are doing much better also. And they always ask students, you know, what made the difference? And that homework strategy continues to crop up. So make sure that you're doing the homeworks the, the best way. And also, uh, you want to get the most out of the SI sessions, tutorial centers, and even office hours and study groups. And the way to do that is to work on understanding the concept yourself before you go to the tutorial center or before you go to SI. Now, I do know that with the SI attendance, a lot of people went just before the test. Uh, because they knew it was going to be a review. That's not the best way to use the SI session. You want to go consistently and cover the material as the course is going because everything in chemistry builds on everything else. Come prepared to ask questions and then explain things to the tutor and ask, am I thinking about this the right way or do I need to state it a different way? And so you can use all those resources, but use them in a way that is to your benefit and not your detriment. <clears throat> and so as we come to a close, um, there are lots of Center for Academic Success services that you can avail yourselves of. Um, there are these Go Academic Workshops. How many people went to a Go Academic Workshop at the beginning of the semester? Ah, just about four or five people. Okay, those <laughs> slides, I'll show you the uh, website. Those slides actually are on the web. So if you didn't go, go on the website and then you can go through the PowerPoint slides. There are some UXL workshops for the discipline-specific courses. Uh, there are individual consultations. You can sit down with a learning strategies consultant, and they can talk with you about your specific learning strategies. And we have the Tutorial Center in Middleton, and also the website. Uh, I told you we were named the number one learning center. Our website was named one of the top three websites in the nation for learning centers. And this is what it looks like. And when you go to the home page, you'll see that Go Academic, and you can click on that and it takes you to the PowerPoints. See anybody else in there you recognize? <laughs> okay, yeah, that's uh, Dr. Cook. <clears throat> and uh, the person in the middle was her SI leader last year. Um, he was outstanding. He won an international SI award. He's in um, optometry school now in Memphis. And so, uh, oh, that's the other thing. For those of you who are going to be doing really well, and now that you have all these great learning strategies, we want to hire you at the Center for Academic Success to become a tutor or become an SI leader. So think in terms of, of doing something like that. OK, so I have a challenge uh, for this class. And um, based on what happened the last two years, I showed you 2011. Uh, they ended up with a, like a 77, the students who came. The year before it was about 76. So I think that you guys can have an 80% average on the next exam. And so let me just ask, how many people uh, believe that this class, if you put these strategies in effect, you could have an 80% average on the next test? Ah, OK. Well, you guys are, are much better than the students at the LSU Dental School, and I'll show you that information in a minute. They didn't think they could do it. But then I asked how many people are willing to try the strategies. Everybody's hand went up, and that's all I needed. So how do I know that you can do this? In 2004, I gave this class to the LSU Dental uh, School students. In their histology course, the averages had been 74 to 78. I challenged that class to make an 85, uh, 84 average on the next test. They didn't think they could do it, but they said they were willing to try. That class ended up with an 85 average. And so what I would like for you to do is, as the writing exercise that you're going to get five points for, we've talked about a lot of different strategies. And so I want you to just pick one or two, if you want to, that you will commit to using until the next exam. Because if you don't start it within the next 48 hours, you probably will never try it. And so write on the paper, write your name and your 8-9 number. 
Okay, put your name and your 8-9 number and indicate which strategy you want to try. And then as a final note, this is our website address. We also have online workshops. You can determine your learning style. We have workshops on test preparation, all kinds of stuff. And, and so that's the writing exercise that you want to do. Okay, well thank you very much and I wish you guys great success in Chem 1201 and throughout the future. Thank you, Dr. McGuire. Oh. And when you're done with your writing exercise, make sure that you have put your name and your 89 number. Uh, here is the box, you can deposit in it. Oops. <laughs> Sorry about that. Oh, okay. I don't think I broke it. <laughs> <laughs>